Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast, available on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Amazon Music. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, X, and Rumble. And of course, be sure to visit mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, onto the show. They killed my dog. This is how this is going to work. You're going to get a new partner, and then you're going to get back out there. What's up with him? Her. Jake. She's been known to snap. I know the feeling. Let's get that off you. She's the one. Jake, what do you want? Lacey was drugged. I didn't know what that's about. Jake, get on the ground! You're playing a game and you don't have a team. Good girl. You didn't get back out there? So I said click, click, bow. You sent in the human torpedo here. The guy with all the issues. Fire me. Can care less. What, you shot one guy and you stabbed another? What the hell are you gonna think of next? Well, I'm sure I'll think of something. How did you manage this? You don't have a scratch on you. Oh, thanks. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 558. Releasing September 29 in theaters and digital across the U.S. is Muzzle a crime thriller that stars Aaron Eckhart as as LAPD K-9 officer Jake Rosa, who after losing his beloved K-9 partner Ace during a shootout, goes rogue in search for those responsible. Joining him is his new partner Sox, a violent K-9 with a mysterious past. A gritty crime drama about two broken souls trying to find redemption and justice in the mean streets of Los Angeles, Muzzle also marks the latest film, from director John Stolberg Jr., I'm glad to say he joins me now on the podcast. John, I thank you so very much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. So it's really interesting. Movies that deal with um, canines, pol- the police, usually fall in the in the you know subgenre of kind of like the the, the the buddy company kind of film. Muzzle is very much a, a serious crime thriller. It deals with serious themes. It's very much a character driven drama. What was it about this this story about uh, this uh, of of dog and man um, that really spoke to you and, and your writing partner Carla Eubank um, that really spoke to you both in regards to putting together a really kind of you know not only action packed kind of thriller movie but a really I f- I find a really effective drama um, about you know both of these characters because in, in in a lot of ways. Socks is a character in the film. I was really interested about the the conception of this movie. Yeah, well, that was the core of the idea. When I saw an officer uh, driving down the highway, we had just wrapped a film that Carlisle wrote and I directed called Crypto with Kurt Russell Mm -hmm. and um, your fellow countryman, Luke Hemsworth, actually. And we were driving to the wrap party. I saw this police officer involved in a conversation, which would look like he was talking to his partner. And as we passed the car, I saw that it was a dog sitting in the front seat. It was a canine vehicle. And the entire idea for the film just kind of occurred to me of treating it in a sort of, it was a dark rainy night too. It was a very moody kind of thing. And I pitched it to Carlisle when I got in the rap party. He's a huge dog lover, as am I. He raises German shepherds. And I said, did you know that when a police officer's 
partner as a canine unit, as a canine handler, is killed. They give it a full police burial. The statutes in most states in the United States, um, they they consider it the killing of an officer when a canine is killed on duty. Um, and the uh, he responded to the idea immediately. And he said, did you know that they speak to their dogs in German? I train German Shepherds. So I, as a dog lover, and I've always trained my dogs and had these great relationships with dogs growing up. Right now, I've got a big, big fat bulldog. Um, but uh, but he's trained pretty well. So that that was kind of the the core idea of it. And then approaching it from a human and character perspective, from saying these are two characters. Let's not treat one like a dog, one like a person. Let's let's try to shoot it and write it as if these are both uh, on an equal playing field because um, that's what this film is going to be. And so, so we started exploring the idea. It was interesting to us that these canine officers, they train these dogs that aren't intrinsically um, human attackers to, to be violent and want to chase and attack human beings. Uh, it's not in their nature, um, but they, they sort of turn these dogs into, which have their Belgian Malinois for the most part, and can't, you know, uh, they're also German shepherds, but Belgian Malinois primarily nowadays. And mm. these are, these are some people call them fur missiles. I mean, they're, they're unbelievable machines uh, as, as a species, what they can do physically and in terms of their jaws and whatnot, but they're not, their instinct isn't to bite people. So they train them to do that and they go through a really rigorous training process. So the whole training process became fascinating to us. And also the notion that these handlers took the dogs home with their families at night and they became part of the family, that they were pets, um, that they hung out with their children and sometimes they're very young children. That all became really interesting to us. Um, so we started delving into the, the thing and then and then we just started weaving the story out. The kinship between Sox and, um, and Jake in the movie is really interesting to me. Um, there's a line in the movie um, where someone says um, we can never escape being animals in, re in regards to to Jake and some of the things that are, that happen happening to him. Um, I mentioned in my introduction how both Jake and Socks are like these two broken souls, and through each other they kind of find redemption. That was something that was really interesting as well, um, especially in the context of Socks. Like as you said in your in your answer just then, he's very much a character. He's not just. A, sometimes with movies like this, the animal uh, protagonist can be used as a tool of kind of like emotional manipulation. But there's a backstory here with socks. There's an arc here as well. How important was it not only to make sure that that arc uh, registered and that arc was was fleshed out in the script, but also that that kinship between um, the, the the Jake and socks be like really kind of um, uh, not only uh, emotional and psychological, but almost kind of primal in a sort of way as well. Yeah, I mean, it was critical to the film working. And um, that line that's delivered by a terrific character actor named Granger Hines, who plays the psychiatrist that's mandated during a, what is a de facto homicide investigation during an officer-involved shooting. And that was interesting, too, mm. to find out that that's the process that these officers have to go into, um, specifically with the character who's having to dredge up his PTSD past. He was He's a war veteran. Um, he was a Marine. So there's all that thing uh, sort of, you know, coming out in his psychiatry sessions where that line is. And we wanted not only the relationship between the dog and the kinship, as you say, and the protagonist in the film to be concrete and, and realistic and deep and meaningful, but also we wanted the Sox character to essentially, and maybe I'm giving away too many secrets or I'm looking into my own stuff too much and um, but it is sort of an anthropomorphized version or, or personified version of the trauma that he's uncovering in his psychiatric uh, evaluation. So so essentially, what is the film about? And Carlisle and I kept talking about this film being about the control of your animal, controlling your animal. And that's what these guys are trying to do. These actual police officers are covered in bruises and cuts and and gigantic cuts on their hands from accidental bites from their dogs. Um, and, and they're attempting to control something dangerous and uh, it's also a, an animal that you can have a loving relationship with. Um, and in order to sort of control this thing, you have to be in control yourself. And so it became the, the animal in the film became 
this really powerful metaphor. And in order for the metaphor to work, I mean, seeing Jake sort of caged throughout the film when he's jogging and socks is caged. You see socks in the reflection of the shattered mirror. You see Jake. I mean, we're trying to constantly create this connection and this relationship between those two characters because in effect, they have a very similar arc. They're both these kind of trouble and represent each other. Um, they're the same character. So uh, that's maybe the deeper kind of like analysis. And maybe that's my own thing. I probably shouldn't say any of this stuff, but, but that's my own take on the movie. So it was critical to answer your question. The chemistry between um, Aaron Eckhart and Sox, the, 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 the dog that plays Sox, I mean, is really kind of like, you can feel it in the film. Um, I'm curious, does Aaron take, um, have, take a lot of time uh with socks in in real life are they are they hanging out with each other um is there uh, does uh are they comfortable with one another before uh filming because i'm really interested about how that kind of dynamic uh plays out off screen as well um to make it work on screen yeah it's a complex dynamic and it was a new experience for me working with animals it's one of the sort of cardinal sins of a filmmaker right it's like be careful working with children animals shooting on the water these things um, it, it comes with a lot of difficult to navigate logistics in terms of our trainer, David Alsbury and his team who were fantastic, but I had never done that before. So when you have three trainers on set and you have to work with a dog for six weeks prior to shooting in order to do one scene, and you have to do that for each scene. So they're individual tricks that you're teaching the dog to do. It's very complicated. It was critical for me to try to create a relationship between Aaron and, and the dog, when I first met with him, I actually had his apartment. I had uh, Andrew Resnick, our production designer, fully build out Jake Rosser's the apartment. That's the character that Aaron plays. So I met with him and I said, hey, do you want to drive down the street with me? He didn't even know where we were going. I had called the animal handlers to have the dogs there in his fully dressed apartment as if he'd woken up that day. And, you know, still left a pot of coffee on. And and so I, I made it like this very organic thing. I'd heard Aaron and we'd had a couple conversations, but I'd heard he was a method actor. And so he would, maybe this would appeal to him. I kind of went out on a limb and just said, this is what I'm going to do. And when he walked mm -hmm. in the apartment, he met his dogs. And, and this was prior to shooting. And uh, there were two dogs playing the hero dog uh, socks. So we had a dog named Jagger, who was the more aggressive dog he was the one that sort of we use for a lot of the chomping when you see the dog barking or chomping or attacking that's jagger and we had the sort of what was originally going to be the backup dog a dog named lego they're both long hair belgian malinois um the lego was going to be the uh sort of again like seen in wide shots or sort of the shots where he's snuggling or, or doing something kind of cozy or something like that and aaron started creating a relationship with both dogs what happened was organically he actually had uh, um, a more prickly reception from Jagger. And so when he met with Jagger, Jagger actually snapped at him. And just like we do mm. in the movie, that's Jagger. And so we started to transition into using Lego more and more and more. And so Lego became sort of the Sox character more. Um, and it's Jagger in moments. But they did have to create that relationship. We didn't have as much time as you'd think, just a few days for them to kind of hang out and get to know each other. Also, um, uh, Rhaegar, who played the the uh, German Shepherd as well, he was in there. And so so Aaron got a chance to do that. But but ultimately, it was a very technical um, execution of their relationship with David and his team of trainers. It was, it was actually incredibly complex. And so it doesn't necessarily allow for things to be organic in terms of a relationship. You have to really make them feel organic, but they're actually quite contrived and, and rehearsed and pre-planned. The Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is brought to you by Tee Public. Tee Public is the world's largest marketplace for independent creators to sell their work on the highest quality merchandise. With over 1.2 million designs, Tee Public is sure to have something you will love. Please support Matt's Movie Reviews on Patreon. Get access to exclusive content, request movie reviews and top 10 lists, and help support my work. Please click on the Patreon link in the description below. I'm curious about um, some of the creative decisions in regards to showing uh, the perspective of the dog, not only through 
um, the eyes of, of the dog uh, of socks in the movie, but also there are moments in the film where um, it, it looks like there might be some type of body cam footage as well, maybe attached to the dog's collar and such. Um, yeah. What was the decision like in in having making sure that that perspective was shown uh, from that point of view of, of the canine in the movie? Was that something that um, you always wanted to um, uh, have uh, within the film from the very beginning? Yeah, I mean, we sat down when we were designing the film and I was having conversations with my cinematographer, Peter Vermeer, who's uh, I've worked with on three films. Uh, he shot Crypto, Bad Hombres, which is coming out November 17th, and this film. And one of the first things he said uh, over a coffee was he said, we should hear what the dog hears, right? I mean, even though he's a cinematographer, mm -hmm. he said, we should see what the dog sees. Um, what is it like to treat an animal visually like uh, a character where well, you would cut to a POV shot of a character, just like you would cut to a POV shot of a dog. However, dogs, they hear differently. And uh, we consider that an advantage when you're in a tactical situation and they see better sometimes, but um, they see differently. And how do they see? So we started looking at the color spectrum of dogs. You know, there's sort of a, a layman understanding that dogs are colorblind, but it's not exactly true. They don't see in black and white. They see color on a different spectrum. So we explored what that spectrum was and we worked with our colorist, Alex, and, and we tried to sort of emulate to a certain degree how a dog would really see the world, uh, how a dog would hear the world, the sounds, um, and, and really approach it uh, uh, as if this is not um, a character that exists on a lesser uh, scale of importance. It's, it's as important as any other character. We're going to approach it that way visually and in the narrative as well um and and try to elevate the character to be a uh you know a over the shoulder shots for example we're going to shoot it that way um i i yeah i mean so that was definitely an approach uh and hopefully it comes across it comes across really well it's something that i really appreciate it because um you know i don't think i've ever I've seen it before in regards to the perspective of of the uh the animal in that way so i really uh I really uh um maybe stand up and notice i really appreciated that oh, cool. um uh, amongst this this kind of relationship between uh socks and jake um is the these really kind of pressing real world issues um especially when it comes to the environment of los angeles um here in in australia we, we we've been hearing so much about uh the the fentanyl uh crisis that's happening over in in the u.s and and also the, the dynamics at play in regards to um, the drugs coming in through China, then through Mexico, through the cartels, et cetera. Um, when it comes to um, Los Angeles, when it comes to that that very pressing issue of, of fentanyl, um, how important was it for you to make sure that that, that the stakes at play in regards to that, um, the real life um, dangers, the real life um, uh, kind of like, environmental kind of impacts that that that, that the, the fentanyl crisis has has um in the real world is really um displayed in a very kind of um uh, realistic and also very um uh world building kind of way within within your movie because i found that's that whole kind of uh the whole scenario that plays out in the movie is really effective because um it almost seems like it, it's like jake and and um socks versus the world in a sort of way because the issue is just so big and affects so many people and it's in it's it's in it's huge on a, on a very global scale well la is my hometown i was born in hollywood i live in the hollywood hills so i i sort of say that you know i live 10 minutes from where i was born so i never made it far in life um but this is my hometown and i see what's going on around it um it, I still love LA, but it's depressing. I mean, because for the most part, you can drive, have a nice uh, few moments driving through the city, and then you're in a zombie apocalypse. And it, mm. these these guys now, it's it, it's fentanyl laced trank, and these guys are like zombies. They're they're bent over crazily, touching th their bodies are contorted in these bizarre, and they're sort of almost frozen. It's 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 getting to a point of it's impossible to ignore. And I'm committing the crime possibly with this film of noticing, and. I, how else am I going to portray LA? So at first I'm sort of setting out um, and I'm, and I'm, you know, I've, yeah, I've got a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. I live in LA and I live in Hollywood and, and, 
this is the reality of the city and it's depressing sometimes. And I'm feeling really negative and, and, and misanthropic about the whole thing. And I say, hey, you know, screw it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to show it the way it really is, you know, and, and make this sort of hate letter to LA. And, uh, and then I go through the process of making the film and only through the process of making the film, this is weird. And maybe it sounds cliche, but did I rediscover my, how much I love LA? And when I was finished mm. making the film and I was driving through Laurel Canyon and it was uh, 75 degrees and, you know, the sun was shining and it, it just the, the top was down. It felt I thought my, I love L.A. So I changed the ending of the film through the edit, working with Bella Erickson, my editor, who I've worked with on on two films. She also cut Bad Hombres and was introduced to me through Nick Cassavetes, who I'd worked with. And she had cut God as a bullet for him. And we started toying with the ending. And I ended up just completely, it was kismet, shooting, being one of the first people to even cross the new Sixth Street Bridge, which is this like unbelievable uh, piece of industrial architecture in Los Angeles. It's it's actually spectacular. And it's I'd never seen anything like it. I'd heard they were ripping down the old viaduct and building something for years and years. But when they actually happened to open it and we drove across it, it was like this kind of epiphany and the sun was beautifully setting behind downtown Los Angeles. And it, it changed my whole idea of the film. So we originally had this very kind of bleak, misanthropic ending and uh, we converted it through the process of making the film into a, into a hopeful ending for the city. Now, it, it remains to be seen if there's hope at the end of the tunnel in terms of the fentanyl crisis writ large and, and what's going on. Um, I don't know. And I do sort of have these waves of, 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 uh, you know, feelings of bleak kind of uh, reality of where we are, but, but I'm, I try to remain optimistic or, or to a certain extent, uh, I'm an optimistic nihilist, whatever I can do to kind of get through my day and raise my daughters and try to create films that you guys can, can, uh, watch and enjoy and potentially talk about. I don't know if there's a solution coming out of this film. It's not a, it's not a, a a film that was generated to kind of create a solution, but it's definitely my statement on on the world around me or reflection of it. So for everyone out there listening, September 29 in theaters and digital muzzle, I really recommend people do go to the theater to watch muzzle because this is a film that I believe should be seen on, on a big screen and should be uh, seen as part of the cinema experience. The, um, uh, the cinematography from Pieta Vermeer, the, the editing, the um, the action scenes, but also I thought that the um, connection between Aaron Eckhart and, and the dogs that played um, socks in the movie was incredibly effective. Um, and i got to say, John Stolberg Jr. has been a, a pleasure to talk to you today. Congratulations with the movie. And hopefully in a few months when your, your next film's out, we can talk again. It's been a pleasure. Happy to talk to you, Matt. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for watching the Matt's Movie Reviews channel. Please subscribe for more reviews, podcast interviews, and exclusive content. Also, if you would like to request a review and support my work, please join my Patreon via the link in the description below.